Hello and welcome to this top grade video on Juliet. We're going to move through the quotations chronologically so that you can build a really powerful argument. We begin with, it is an honour that I dreamed not of. This is Juliet speaking to her mother, telling her that she hadn't really dreamed of this possibility of being married. Now, What's crucial here is that we know this is a complete lie. She's being really careful to hide this from her mother, which is why she calls it an honour, but actually it's something she deeply fears. Why? Because this is a patriarchal society in which her father will choose the person she's going to marry. She knows this because her mother was already married and had already had Juliet when she was Juliet's age. Yes, she had given birth to Juliet when she was 13, and of course her husband, Juliet's father, is now round about 50. So we can see there is a massive age gap between the two. Juliet doesn't want that. She wants to be able to escape this patriarchal arrangement. And so how do we know this? Well, what does she do when she first meets Romeo? She tells him to work out a plan to get them married. Marriage is an honour that is right at the forefront of her mind because she knows her parents are going to do it to her and she wants to escape that and do it for herself with someone she chooses. Our second quotation involves this sonnet that Romeo and Juliet speak together sharing lines as they first meet. That's important, of course, because the sonnet was the form of a love poem, and Shakespeare is therefore indicating that these two people, Romeo and Juliet, are actually falling in love at first sight. However, Shakespeare is also playing a bit of a game here, because the language they use to explore their sexual passion and attraction is religious. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. And what she means here is in the Catholic Church you would have had statues of saints that pilgrims would come and pray to and touch and kiss. Well, that's why they don't move, because they are statues. But using this religious language to explore their sexual attraction towards each other is blasphemous, it's sacrilegious, it's dangerous. They're taking something that's supposed to be holy and using it to describe their lust. Now there is another way that Shakespeare is undermining convention here. Who chats up who? Well, convention would say the male should take the lead, but that's not what's happening here. Romeo tries to take the lead, he begins the sonnet, but he just talks about holding onto her hand and therefore wanting to kiss it better because of his rough touch. Juliet says no because she has to play this game of being sexually unavailable, but she has a deeper plan than that. She wants to be sexually available, and to do that she needs him to kiss her. So her refusal of kissing the hand is really just a way for her to get him to kiss her on the lips. This sudden change is called the Volta. All sonnets had a sudden change in them, a volta. And what happens here is that Juliet is in control of that. She is the one who tells Romeo to kiss her. She says that she will be as still as a statue to enable him to do that. She has to do this because she can't actually make the first move of kissing. But she makes his next line, then move not while my prayer's effect I take, inevitable. She is led up to this moment so that his only option is to kiss her on the lips. Score. She has succeeded in finding an escape from her parents' plans, finding someone she can fall in love with. Now, this view of Juliet also portrays her as a bit manipulative, a bit cunning, and this all feeds into the idea of original sin. This comes from the story of Adam and Eve, and the whole thing about original sin is that we all carry that original sin with us, the one that Adam and Eve took on when they listened to the serpent, ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then got expelled from Eden by God as a punishment. However, Eve received worst punishments in the form of period pains and childbirth because she was the one that the serpent 
first deceived and therefore she is seen as more guilty because she then corrupted Adam. So this allows Shakespearean society to see women as naturally more manipulative, more sinful and more evil than men. Now, does Shakespeare also believe this? I don't think so. That's why he spends so much time showing what a terrible father Capulet is by virtue of being a patriarchal parent who's able to choose Juliet's husband. He sets that whole plot device up to be horrifying to the audience. In other words, Shakespeare wants the audience to completely understand why Juliet would want to break society's rules. What makes Romeo so attractive isn't just that they've fallen in love, it's that she's suddenly got agency, she's got power to make her own decisions, albeit if she keeps those decisions secret from her parents. So Shakespeare is suggesting that women are forced to become manipulative and cunning in order to survive in this really oppressive society where they don't have the freedoms of men. The next quotation is important for two reasons. Firstly, it suggests that actually Juliet is really interested in her sexual passion here rather than love at first sight. And secondly, it shows how the lovers are mismatched. It's not necessarily fate that has doomed this relationship. It is the fact that they shouldn't be together in the first place for lots of other reasons. Let me explain. Here she goes. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. And you can see by placing this last in her thinking, this is what she really wants to get to. She's being modest here because that's the way girls at the time would have been brought up. But actually, the focus is on that part she dare not name. It is the sexual attraction that she feels for Romeo. That's what's uppermost in her thoughts. Remember, this speech is a soliloquy. She does not know that Romeo can hear it. So these are her true thoughts. This is Shakespeare's way of saying, Dear audience member, are you sure this is just love at first sight? Or could it be sexual attraction and lust? Now, secondly, we come to this extraordinary image of a rose. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we could call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So when she asks what's in a name, she could have chosen any symbol, but she picks on a rose. This is a symbol of femininity. In other words, she's taking her masculine lover, or he's not a lover yet, but the husband-to-be, Romeo, and portraying him in the most feminine way she can, as a rose. This hints at the gender divisions that there are in society. So when Romeo kills Tybalt, he complains that Juliet has made him effeminate. She's made him womanly. And that's exactly what happens here before she even speaks to him again. She's portraying him as a female character and personality, which will not work in this patriarchal society. It shows how, from the beginning, they are mismatched. Now, of course, this metaphor is also there for her to explore the mismatch of him being a Montague and her being a Capulet. And this reminds us that Rosaline was also a Capulet. Shakespeare deliberately starts the play with Romeo in love with the wrong person, not because she won't return his favours, but because she's a Capulet. It could never work. Romeo appears to be addicted to the idea of pursuing the wrong woman. Juliet is also pursuing the wrong man and describing him in female terms, making him less manly as it would be seen at the time. A clear signal that they're not as well matched as they both believe. Now, in quotation four, we return to this idea of them being mis... mis now, in quotation four, we return to this idea of them being mismatched. Juliet's language, hist, hist, is a call that she would make to a peregrine falcon. She imagines Romeo as a falcon, 
a very masculine image, you might think. The falcon is a hunter, the peregrine falcon, the tassel gentle, that meant a peregrine, was associated with princes and royalty. However, she is in charge of the falcon. She is therefore taking on the masculine role, as this society would see it, controlling Romeo. This brings us straight back to Eve controlling Adam. It's a sign of original sin. In Elizabethan society, women were subservient to men, yet Julia imagines herself taking the lead. We can argue she doesn't have the lead because she's wishing for a falconer's voice, therefore saying that she doesn't have this control of him. But maybe she does. Maybe she still has the lure. It's just not the voice that she can use to do it because she can't yell out at this time. People will hear her. Romeo will be discovered. He'll be killed. But actually, in the relationship, she does see herself as in control. After all, she's just said, if thy purpose is marriage, send me word tomorrow. And Romeo's gone, OK, I'll marry you. So she's in total control. In our fifth quotation, we'll see how Juliet tries to control Romeo by using the conventions, the patriarchal conventions of the time. So she's asking him if he's willing to marry her, and if so, send word tomorrow. Look at the pressure she puts on him. Basically, she's saying, if you want to enjoy having sex with me, and let's face it, that is what you want, and I want it too, the only way that can happen in our society is for us to be married. You know that, Romeo, she's saying, so get a move on, arrange that marriage. In return, though, I'm not just going to offer my undying love and sexual passion. Oh, no, I'm going to give you all my fortunes. Now, why that's important is that the bride's father would pay a dowry, a load of money, to the groom, the husband, for marrying his daughter. Well, Capulet is Lord Capulet, and the nurse told Romeo that anyone who married Juliet would get the chinks. They would be rich. Juliet isn't naive enough to think that Romeo will only marry her for love, and this is why she introduces not just fortune as fate, but fortune as finance, extreme wealth. And she's saying, I'm going to give it all to you. It's going to be at your feet. This is a masterful piece of negotiation. And we know it works because when Romeo goes to the friar, he tells the friar, I'm going to marry Juliet, the daughter of rich Capulet. Doesn't have to say that Capulet's rich. The friar knows who Capulet is. Why does he say the Capulet's rich? Because he's thinking about the very fortune that Juliet is going to lay before him. Very subtle, isn't it? You probably missed it first time round. But Juliet is no fool, and she knows that to get a man in this patriarchal society, you're going to have to pay. Again, this undermines the idea of it being all about love, and it also shows Juliet's maturity, even for a girl as young as 13, and her smarts. In quotation number six, we can see another way that the lovers are mismatched. Juliet associates love and sexuality with death. So she personifies nighttime as a black browed knight, a lover who's coming to see her. And then her real lover, Romeo, will come. Well, knight, of course, is a homophone. So, you know, N I G H T is the same sound as the knight on horseback with a K. And she's imagining Romeo as this royal kind of figure who's going to come to her bed and consummate the marriage. But night is also a symbol of death, of blackness. And she immediately leaps in the second line to when I shall die. So she's imagining this fate of death immediately and linking it to being with Romeo. So clearly she's linking being with Romeo to dying. This reveals the mismatch. But die also had another meaning in Shakespearean. It was slang, if you like, for sexual orgasm. And so she's also linking sex to death. In the third line, she's characterising that death as the death of a tragic hero. How does that work? Well, all the constellations in the sky are named, as you know. 
and many of them are named after heroic figures from Greek tragedy. So not only is she imagining her own death, she's imagining Romeo having a tragic death, presumably as a result of their marriage, and then the gods using this death in some way to create a new pattern of stars in the heavens. Yes, that portrays Romeo as a hero, but also a tragic hero, one who must die as a result of their marriage. Our seventh quotation happens when she's discovered that Romeo has killed Tybalt and he's not yet arrived to have sex with her. So what does she imagine? She imagines death as a lover coming to her bed and taking her maidenhead, her virginity. Why is she obsessed with her virginity here? Well, because that's what her father and wider society has done. If you think about Juliet, she is never alone out in public. She's always accompanied by the nurse. Why would society do that? Romeo and his friends go out alone all the time. It's to guard their virginity. Their virginity is money in the bank. Capulet can marry his daughter to another rich family, providing she's still a virgin. So there's a massive price on this. The whole family fortunes, in a way, depend on it. But it also shows us, with this contrast of wedding bed and maidenhead, that rhyme, shows us how much she's obsessed with the idea of having sex with Romeo. This marriage is not all about love at all. It's about having the freedom to express sexual desire, something that this society prohibits. Now, there is an autobiographical point about Shakespeare here. He did not wait to have sex till he was married. His wife, who was eight years older than him at 26 and he was 18, was already three months pregnant when they got married. So we can clearly use that as evidence that Shakespeare himself does not believe in this patriarchal view of preserving virginity. And so Shakespeare himself rejects this patriarchal arrangement that we see in Romeo and Juliet. He wants the audience to be critical of it. In our eighth quotation, we're going to look at Juliet's reaction to her parents, which is extreme. Romeo is banished, she said. To speak that word is father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all slain, all dead. In other words, rather than hear that Romeo is banished, she would rather hear that Tybalt is dead, well he is, but also her mother and her father. She would rather her parents were dead than Romeo was banished. This is an extreme point of view. Shakespeare uses it to show how terrible the influence of Juliet's father and her mother are on Juliet. But he's also doing it to point out that Juliet is immature. So another historical fact that will help you here is that Shakespeare based the play on a well-known poem from about 60 years before. In the poem, Juliet is 16. Still young, but Shakespeare has deliberately made her much younger at 13 in order to play up her immaturity. Doing this allows him to show how society, and in particular men, are willing to exploit young women through this control of their sexuality. Quotation number nine dramatizes how society and patriarchal control has damaged Juliet. So to speak to her father, she has to get on her knees. She has to show complete subservience. And then she has to be incredibly polite to him. She has to lie, in effect. She calls him good father, even though he's behaving in a completely unreasonable way and threatening to throw her out on the streets for a life of prostitution. She asks, hear me with patience, but to speak a word. And Capula refuses. She's not allowed to say a single thing. She's totally silenced. And this is symbolic of how society silences women and silences their desires. So Juliet's rebellion against her family no longer seems like the immature actions of a young woman. They seem the logical thing you would do if you had hope. Now the fact that she's 13 helps us understand why she still believes in hope. She hasn't been ground down by this society yet. 
Shakespeare uses this to get the audience to question whether in their own society women are actually ground down by male control. The final quotation is symbolic on so many levels. Let's start with the patriarchal one. She kills herself not with poison, which would be the female way to kill herself, because Romeo's drunk that. She's killing herself with the dagger, a male instrument. So she's displaying male courage here in rebelling against society. But let's look further at this image. The dagger represents masculinity and it represents Romeo. So it also suggests that her death is caused by masculinity and Romeo. Remember Romeo had this dream about some consequence yet hanging in the stars if he went to the Capulet Ball. So he knew it was going to result in death, but he went anyway. So Romeo, in a very real sense, is to blame for Juliet's death. And then we have the sexual imagery. Her body becomes the sheath and she inserts the dagger into it. This is obviously a sexual metaphor, which Shakespeare is using to say that the control of sexuality is what's led to Juliet's death. And so rather than allow her father and mother, particularly her father, to choose who her sexual partner will be, she deliberately chooses to kill herself. So this symbolism attacks patriarchal control. And if you think about it, it comes back to this debate about whether Romeo and Juliet are truly in love. By ending on this sexual image, I think Shakespeare is pushing us a little bit more to sexual passion. Feel free to disagree. Now, if you'd like to see how to use this in some essay writing, then you might consider buying my guide. And if you don't want to spend the money, check out one of the videos appearing over here. No, over here. <laughs> see you soon on my channel.